Welcome to Running in the 70s, where we interview, meet, and get to know athletes of all kind who were running in the 70s. I'm your host, Matthew Kleinoski. Today on the podcast, we are down under in New Zealand talking with someone who's been running for over 60 years, by his estimates, over a thousand races, great successes, wins from corners of the world, from Fiji to Canada, across Europe and down under, and some spectacular pauses in his career that he's had to face challenges. And he married well. Let's today get to know and meet Roger Robinson. Hi, Roger. Hi, Matthew. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. It's, it's nice to be in Toronto. Let's start with your running competitive origin story. How did you first get into racing and what was your experience? The origin story is uh, as a little boy uh, in England, I, I grew up in England, just outside London during the war. So we got blitzed and we got doodle bugged and, and all of those things. I was five or six when the war ended. And so grew up then in that Southwest suburb of London and just down the road from us, about uh, half a mile away was a running track called Motspur Park, which was the sports fields of London university, about 20 minutes by train out from the middle of London. And so they would come out there and play football and cricket. And they had one of the best cinder tracks in those days, any, anywhere in the country. And that was part of my life. My dad used to take me there as a very little boy to watch track meets, and then I would take myself there. My technique, of course, as an eight or nine-year-old boy was to crawl through a hole in the hedge so that I didn't have to pay to go in. But, and all little boys did that. And in fact, I found somebody else who crawled through the hole in the hedge, ran for another club. I didn't know him because he lived the other side of the track. And his name is John Thresher. And he became a rival of mine in later years running in Surrey as a cross-country and track runner. He then moved to Canada and became for a while head of Athletics Canada and still lives in Toronto. So John Thresher and I have this great thing in common that we both crawled through the hole in the hedge to get into Motsa Park. And there we would see MacDonald Bailey, the, the great black sprinter, Arthur Wint, the great Jamaican 400, 800 runner, and a little later, a tall, lean, white runner called Roger Bannister, who would come and do time trials there. And it was a great way to get interested in the sport. And, and there were good women runners, Dorothy Hyman, the sprinter, all kinds. Of, that's when I first got my love of athletics. I was essentially a football kid, a soccer kid, because my dad was a referee. But the running was very much part of it. I was too small and skinny and feeble to, to, to make it as a footballer. So I decided I was going to be a distance runner. would go out when the track was open to the public on a Sunday morning. I'd go, go, out and, go out and run around it. That's how it all started. When did you first get a coach? I've never had a coach. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what happened then? The next point in the story was I got a scholarship to a, what in England is called a public school, which means a private school, of course. And that was a rugby school. And I just loathed rugby because all, all that happened was that people jumped on me and broke my collarbone and, and, and I was much too weak and feeble to be a success at that. So a group of us got permission to start a cross country running club when I was about 13, 14. And we started ourselves and we were allowed to do that instead of playing rugby. We organized the club and we got going and we read some books. There was no coach. There was no teacher in charge. We just did it ourselves. There was an annual school cross country. It developed into a very active and quite successful club. We began to win some inter schools races and things like that. There are other aspects of that really we're very fortunate looking back. This was all at Wimbledon, which everybody has heard of. And, and up above the tennis ground in Wimbledon is Wimbledon Common. And this school, King's College School, was right on Wimbledon Common. And they're on the other side of Wimbledon Common, a number of running clubs used Wimbledon Common for their running. One of them was a club called Thames Hare and Hounds. I discovered that was the oldest running club in the world. 
founded in 1868. We set up as boys, our club secretary, set up to have a race against Thames Heron Hounds. So they would come. Thames Heron Hounds was mainly a club for graduates of Oxford and Cambridge universities. It's not totally closed to that. It's open now and it's still a very successful club. And I'm still a member of it. And we would race against them. And that gave me a sense of the history of the sport, which has remained an ongoing interest. So these two things together, being involved actively myself, loving cross country, because that's not just about finishing speed or muscular power or even competition. It's about interaction with the land as well as with the other runners. Then meeting these guys from Thames and Hounds and reading their club history. When they were the host, we'd go to the changing rooms, which were up above an old pub in Putney, in, in, in London, Ro Roehampton. They literally bathed in old Victorian tin baths, which somebody poured the hot water into. But that's how it was done. So this is not just something I love doing. It's something that had a, his a history to it that really appealed to me. And those two things have been two of the important strands of my life. When you were accelerating it in terms of competence and success, did you get a hold of racing spikes and shoes? And how was that done? Yeah, we taught ourselves. There was a shoemaker in Wimbledon called, if I've got it right, Sandy Law, I think. And he was a, he was a highly skilled cobbler and he made shoes custom made for Bannister. Bannister discovered him and he made shoes out of kangaroo leather. When I was getting more seriously interested in running in, in my last year at high school, I went to him and I had a pair of shoes made by him. They weren't a great success because he and I both we didn't know enough about the whole sport as a whole to realize that the sports, the shoes that he made for a, an 800 miler with no heel were not going to do it. For a cross country runner, because there was absolutely nothing under right. the heel, wasn't the right shoe, didn't really work. It was incredibly light, absolutely beautiful piece of work, but with fixed spikes as well, of course, in, in those days. So I was learning, but very much teaching, teaching myself. When did you have your first success that made you think this was going to be a longer career for you of racing? I won the school cross country finally in my last year. I'd never had obvious, outstanding talent. I was pretty good, but I, I'm very much the kind of runner that it's all in the work. You just have to do the training. And as an illustration of that, I then went on, got a scholarship to Cambridge and my good fortune and bad fortune, both at once were that I got to Cambridge just at a time when it was turning into arguably the best university cross country team that has ever existed. They were. It was just a, a, a phenomenal, in my last year there as an undergraduate, I didn't make the A team for the race against Oxford. And just to illustrate how good that team was, number three in the team, not number one, was a young Australian who had just arrived, having won the Olympic gold medal in Rome called Herb Elliott. And, and Herb, at the peak of his career, was only number three in that team. The British marathoner, Tim Johnston, who died last year, was one of that team. The, the great British cross-country runner, Mike Turner, became a really close friend of mine. When I said I didn't have a coach, I've had friend mentors over the years, and, and Mike was the main one of those. He was the same age as me, but I know I'm more seriously committed or something to, to running than I had been. And it was at that time that I began to get really more serious about it. I trained, I think, seven days in a week for the first time when I was about 21 at Cambridge and under, under Mike's influence. What was the schoolboy championship distance and the races at Cambridge distance mainly? But our school race, the senior race was about four and a half miles on Wimbledon Common. The Oxford Cambridge race, it was seven and a half miles. So 12 K that's a traditional course. Of course it has to vary a bit like all cross country courses do, but that's a course that Chataway and Bannister both ran in, in their time. And it goes right back to, to the late 19th century. And that race, the Oxford versus Cambridge race every year is organized by the club that I talked about, Thames and Hound. So that was all part of this, the kind of historical thing. I'm trying to give a sense of, of how in England at that time, your running was mixed up with the history of it and it had that extra dimension. 
is it accurate then to say that the public's awareness, the press coverage of at least publishing the results was, there was awareness as oh, part yes. of tradition. Yeah. Oh, the Oxford Cambridge race with all, the result and a, and, a, and a report on the race would always be in or mo most of the main newspapers, not so much the popular tabloids because they didn't do anything but football. But yes, there was awareness and there was a, a big crossover between cross country and the stars of the track. There's something about their training. I've obviously got interested in the training of Jack Lovelock, the New Zealander who won the gold medal 1500 meters in 1936. People have always said he trained so lightly, but what they forget is that all through the winter, he was running cross country and those races went up to seven and a half and the main championships in England, the South of England, North of England, and the national championships at that time in my day were all over nine miles. Wow. You get, th you get three big muddy hilly laps and that, that was pretty tough running. <laughs> yeah. What year was that your senior year? At Cambridge when you were 1961. Okay. And what did you see? Everything's amateur at this point. So in your continuing with your academic career, what did you see would be your ongoing activity with running in the future? Did you look into the future at all? I always expected it to end because in those days it did, Matthew. People didn't keep running their whole lives. There were one or two older members of Thames there and Hounds were there and they were in the 60s or 70s and they seemed to us incredibly old. And you'd see the, you'd see, you'd see the, the occasional older runner, but they were freaks really. I remember when Tim Johnston told me that he was going to concentrate, this is before the 1968 Olympics, and he was in a, starting a law career. And he told me that he was going to concentrate on his running for a year. These are completely amateur days. You couldn't earn a, a cent from running. I couldn't even write an article about running and be paid for it without losing my amateur status. Uh, and so it seemed to me somehow improper, you know, that you should take a year off concentrating on, on running. I still remember that. I was wrong, of course. Tim was right. He was ahead of the game. But it took a while for me to get my head around that. Uh, and... I just kept running. I remember a friend who was an artist saying to me once when I was about 24 or five, and I was doing my PhD back at Cambridge then, and he said, you're a bit of an oldie for this running business, he said. And, and I remember then thinking, I don't think I am. But when I moved to New Zealand in 1968, when I was in my late twenties, I think somebody then said it's a good place to end your running career. And you were always thinking it was going to end. And I think it wasn't until I was about in in my thirties or something, thirties or more getting, and I thought, why should it end? I'm still enjoying it. And, and then that's another part of the story, which we can get onto, but the England, yeah. I, I, my, my situation was a moderately talented runner, not never outstandingly talented, but found myself surrounded by better athletes and, and through them learned that the only way I was going to get anywhere was by training hard. That was really the story. I just kept doing it and getting occasional successes that kind of fired me and kept me going. Yeah, I think your success list, if people don't know about your career, you're understating it. You've won races on different continents, run from the marathon and on down. Uh, lots of wins among your thousand plus races. But let me just ask you what it was like for things like the Olympics. While they were amateur in the 60s, were 1968 Mexico City, it would be after bedtime when some of those races were taking place in the evening. Were you watching all of the Olympics? Was that something you could fit in before you left the, oh boy, and you were down in New Zealand maybe when that actually happened. No, I've got, I've got vivid memories of the Olympics in that era. Uh, 1960, I was a student at Cambridge, 20 years old, and I went to Rome and wow. stayed and, 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 got, and bought the cheapest seats in the stadium, stayed in the cheapest possible accommodation, which turned out to be a nunnery. <laughs> <laughs> I had two weeks at a nunnery. It was a girls' school run by nuns, and, and basically we all slept in the dormitories. There were just a bunch of blokes, and several of the Cambridge runners were there. 
Bruce Tuller was actually at Cambridge at that time and he was in the British team. And so we went partly to support him and he became a lifelong friend. I wrote about that in, in a book and I wrote about those Rome Olympics and especially the day, which I still remember vividly, when the two New Zealanders won gold medals. Yeah. At that date, I had no idea I was ever going to New Zealand. It, was, it wasn't part of the plan or anything like that. I was only 20, hadn't finished my first degree yet, hadn't got, gone back and done a PhD. But the way Halberg won his race, I just want to talk about that, Matthew, because in a way it tells you what, yeah. I, what kind of runner I am. And, and a lot of people be like this. I've got no finishing sprint, whatever. I was born without any fast twitch fibers. Always at school races over 100 yards, always finished dead last. Hopeless. I watched Halberg, and in that 5,000 meters, he made a sudden break with three laps to go and put about 20 or 30 meters on the field and held on desperately. And he kept looking over his shoulder. And this big East German was after him called Grodotsky. And I was surrounded by young Germans in the crowd. They were all charging Dotsky, Grodotsky. <laughs> and I would squeak Halberd. And I, I still, Murray died last year. And of course, being in New Zealand later, I got to know him a bit. That race is still the greatest race I've ever seen because it really struck a chord. And I thought, if I'm ever going to win races, that's how I've got to do it. By getting wow. them early on, getting away early on, making them work when they're resting up, waiting for the finish, surprising them three, four, five laps from the finish or halfway through a road race or whatever it is. Just you strike when you've got the advantage and don't leave it to the last 400. So I actually saw the Rome Olympics, the Tokyo Olympics. I'd just gone back to Cambridge and watch those on British television in the flat of, or watch in the home of the landlady of my friend, Mike Turner, upstairs above his flat. The theme song for the, for that still runs through my head. And in 68, I had just moved to New Zealand right. and I didn't have a television at my home. So I used to go to a, somebody who I'd met, a new, a new running friend and his name is Sam McLean, and I still see him. He's a coach now, and he's coming to stay with me during the national championships next week. And I called it Samming. I'm going Samming. I'd go to Sam's parents' place and, what, and watch on his television. And I still remember moments like the steeplechase and, and the British commentator talking about the American, I think it was George Young and the Australian O'Brien out in front. And then suddenly the two Kenyans came through. And I still, still remember the commentator saying, it's Kogo and buy what? It's Kogo and buy what? No, it's buy what and Kogo. <laughs> wow, that's, that's great right? vivid memories. Yeah. Oh, and I, I remember words always. I just love that, 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 that just because it sounded such nonsense. And here was this guy who didn't even put his foot on the top of the water jump. He flew right yeah, over it. Yeah, just turtled it. Yeah. And it was just, and then, of course, we were looking at the beginning of a totally new phenomenon. That was really the beginning of the Kenyan explosion. Yeah. So yes, so those three Olympics, I've got different memories of. Let's inform people of your studies. Were you studying English as a language and literature from the beginning through this? What exactly was your was focus? was always English and essentially English literature, not the language. My BA was in English literature. Then I went back to Cambridge and did my PhD working on the 18th century novelist, Henry Fielding, who wrote Tom Jones. What interested me, and this is, is, has remained true of me, is that it went beyond literature because he was very interested in using literature partly to promote social ideas. He was a magistrate. He was a reformer. He wanted to solve crime problems and poverty problems and all of those things. That connection between literature and journalism has remained an ongoing interest of mine. Not the only one, but that was my PhD. So the, no, the, the English novel became my main focus. And then when I got a job teaching English literature, I of course had to expand and teach different courses. And my main emphasis moved then on to more than 19th century novel and writers like Thomas Hardy, Dickens, and then 20th century writers, and, and then 
in New Zealand, I quite naturally and properly got interested in New Zealand literature and ended up with that and Pacific literature also as being among main issues. I, I never wanted to be a narrow specialist. I never wanted to be the Thomas Hardy man or anything. That right. seemed, to me, seemed to me to be boring. <laughs> I wanted to keep moving about and trying new ideas. And I still do that to a great extent. My main publication probably was a book called The Oxford Companion to New Zealand Literature, which is a vast 500 page, huge compendium of details, which I edited and wrote about a third of. And that was a big one. And, and, and I've done, done published work later on Catherine Mansfield, New Zealand writer, Robert Louis Stevenson, and his writings about the Pacific, as well as influential work about Thomas Hardy and Dickens and a writer called Samuel Butler, who I particularly like because he was a runner. <laughs> so I got, I, I got a nice crossover there. Let's talk about what was the impetus for your move to New Zealand and what happened to your running upon landing there. I was supposed to be in Queenstown this week. I had a medical thing and they, that I couldn't fly. So we canceled the trip. We vacationed a lot in New Zealand. So I'm familiar with what I've been all across the North and South Island on vacationing, kayaking and hiking everywhere. But what's your story for how did that move there? come to be and wh what happened with your running upon landing there? I went back to Cambridge after three years of school teaching to do the PhD because I thought I was really still interested in the actual subject and I felt that I, maybe there was a possibility there. Got the Cambridge PhD, taught, taught at the University of Leeds for a year in Yorkshire in England and so, and so ran up there and made friends who I'm still in contact with. Then I was looking for a permanent job. And they were, as always, they, at that point, they'd got hard to get in the subject of English. And I'd look at different possibilities. And I'd got a very good friend at Cambridge who was a lawyer, law student. He was doing his PhD in law. He, he was a New Zealander from Auckland and a very, a very good runner. had known Halberg and L Lydiard and that, that whole group when he was in Auckland. He wasn't quite national standard, but he was close. A man called Jim Farmer. And he's gone on and become a very distinguished barrister in Auckland. And we're still in touch sometimes. And partly through his talking about New Zealand, and I started to look around and I thought of Australia. And I couldn't really go to America on a postdoctoral research thing because by then I was married and, and had two children to my first wife. So I, there were constraints. I needed a job. I, I couldn't just do another, I, I couldn't just do another research position. I began to find out about New Zealand and partly through Jim's conversations and, and it looked interesting and there were a couple of jobs going and I applied for one of them and got it. Oh, and one moment, <laughs> you'll like this story, the, nobody is in Scotland. There were two jobs going uh, th that week in the, in the Times Higher Educational Supplement. One was in Canterbury, New Zealand, and the other was in Aberdeen at the far north of Scotland. And I thought, if I'm going to Aberdeen, I might as well go to Christchurch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually having been to Aberdeen, because I, I had a very good friend there, I think I was right. Aberdeen feels at least as remote as you've been to New Zealand. It's a long yeah. way to get there. But, but once you're there, there is nowhere on earth which is more aware of everything that's going on in the whole world than New Zealand. Because of their remoteness, people really work at staying informed. In a way, you could be in provincial America, and you're much more remote and provincial and narrow-minded than anybody is in New Zealand, where they're looking outwards all the time. And they're traveling and wherever you go, you're going to yeah. they're, they're the great Viking explorers. Yeah. And they can talk, they can enter into the discussion of what's going on in America too. No. <laughs> oh, I'm trying now. <laughs> you know, but my wife, Catherine, now, go, now goes to parties and she says, I'm going to wear a badge that says, don't ask me about Trump. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, there is this, uh, there's great runners who are on far ends of the political spectrum. So when I interview them, I have to say, okay, we bring up politics. I know you're passionate and some of it in uh, yeah, east, left, right, different directions. That's great. 
We can still run against people, even if we disagree with them. That's fine. That's one of the things I love about running is that you actually don't ask those questions. You don't ask whether, whether people are right or left or whether they're male or female or non-binary or whatever they are, they're welcome to be any of them. But once you're in a race, you're going to try and beat them. <laughs> and then after yeah. the race, you're going to be great mates. Those two things yeah. go together. It's the most inclusive activity you could possibly conceive, which is something I really love about it. Yeah. It's only Facebook that ends up revealing some of the inner thoughts and the inner demons that people have. It doesn't oh, come yeah, out of the course. Yeah. You went to Christchurch, which is in yes. the Southern Island. Yeah. And, uh, yeah beautiful place. Mm. And what was the running scene like there that you found? It was very active. Of course, this was in the post Lydian era. Lydian was still alive and going strong, but the great 1960s was over and the next generation of Quacks and Dixon Walker was on its way up. You know, I, I arrived in 68. And so that generation really began to assert itself in 1970 when Quacks got a medal in the Edinburgh Commonwealth Games and then Walker and Dixon, uh, no, Dixon in, in, um, in Munich yeah. in Munich in 72 and then Walker and Dixon in 74. And, and so it was a little bit down at top level in, in 68, but uh, the overall standard was very high. There were people all over the place running a hundred miles a week because that's what Lydia had told them to do. The main difference from the scene in England was that things in New Zealand, because of the geography of the country and the thinness of the population, things are more local. So you tended to run against the same people almost at every race. Whereas in England, there's so many more people and so many more clubs and, and you could move around and you're running against in different places and against different groups all, all the time. That was something I had to adjust to, but you do it, you do adjust to it. Um, well, you, well, you, were, had great a yeah, you had a family then, but how, how far afield did you ever go for racing in the next few years? I go, if there's a championship or a major relay or something like that, you, yeah, you'd fly. I remember flying to Hamilton, the North Island for my first New Zealand track championships. I remember that because I got sick on the plane. It was an old DC three. <laughs> and then those years I didn't run very well. I, I ran quite well to begin with, but then the pressures of work and family and everything else, and I began to get sick and had some rather down years. And then when I moved, I got offered the professorship at Wellington, Victoria University of Wellington in 1975, when I was 35. And I think the climate there seemed to be better, windy and fresh and, and Christchurch is rather misty and, and dank and it was smoky at that time. And I began to run better. And then in 1976 to seven, to my surprise, I'd been in the England team in 1966 and 67. And then I got back into the New Zealand team in 1977. So then I travel. I'm trying to answer your question about how far did we travel? You traveled to Germany that time. <laughs> and and yeah, the, university, the university gave me permission. I remember negotiating with the, the leave committee as, as it was called. And we worked out a kind of protocol as to how this would be appropriate and decided that if it was an activity, which was going to bring some credit to the university, such as sport or music. I had in mind that somebody might be a member of a choir or something like that and want to travel. And so they were given permission to take leave right. for, for a period of two or three weeks as needed. Later on, all, all of that got more flexible. For people who don't know, Wellington is the government capital and at the southern end of the North Island of New Zealand, another yeah beautiful place with a waterfront. And I assume, uh, Pretty international community. Is that true with the uh, embassies and consulates? Yeah. yeah. At one stage, I was dean of a faculty called Languages and Literatures. So I was dealing with a lot of the ambassadors and the cultural ambassadors from, because all the embassies have their bases, their, their embassies in Wellington. So I'd be dealing with Indonesia and China and, 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 uh, and France and, and so on and arranging visiting speakers and 
all I'm dealing with the students and all that kind of thing. Yes, so Wellington is quite an international place. It's also because you, you described it well, right at the southern end of the North Island, which means it protrudes into Cook Strait. So it gets the winds for the Pacific from one side and the winds from the Tasman on the other side. And it's probably the windiest place in the world. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm because, sure. Yeah, taking that ferry to the South Island is a hit or miss, especially in the last <laughs> year or so. Quite a few canceled ferries. I always say living in Wellington is like living on a ship in terms of the climate. The weather changes every minute and it's, it's never very hot or very cold, but it's always interesting. It's challenging. Y yesterday was a very strong wind. Today is not, is not so bad, but next week we have the National Track Championships in Wellington. And a lot will depend on what the weather does. Look, what, let's go back to review before we talk about life in New Zealand again. What was your best accomplishment with the England team, UK team, your competitions there by the time you left? What were your proudest or best accomplishments, you think, that when you left? It's always nice when you win. And I won. The county I ran in was Surrey. It was a very strong county. Sorry, would win the inter-county cross-country, for instance. And there were some really great runners there, several Olympians. So I won the Surrey cross-country. Great surprise. I won the Surrey three miles, as it was, 5,000 meters, in what was a county record. And the record had been held by Gordon Pirrie, who is an Olympic silver medalist. And the other big one, I think, was winning. This is important for me. Sorry to interrupt myself, but I told you, in my undergraduate years, I didn't make the Cambridge number one team because the team was so strong. So then later when I came back to Cambridge and was by then older and running better, and I won the British Universities Championship. So that was nice having not, as, it, as they say, got my blue, which you can only get by running against Oxford, that I did, I, I felt then that I'd through myself and made up for it, made up for not getting the blue by winning the British University Championship. So that was a nice one to get. We talk about the camaraderie and the spirit of the shared experience of this racing. You obviously had to be a competitive person through this. How did that change over time when you had a family? had your schedule, health maybe wasn't the best, running wasn't the best. How did that affect you? Uh, the first ramp off. I'm certainly competitive in, ra in races, and, that, and that's what it's all about. Only in the race. No, I've always been happy to make as many possible friends of the people I run against. I mean, now at this age, now I've got these incredible friendships with all these people, which, and we used to try to beat the hell out of each other. <laughs> And we've got a group in Wellington and we meet once a month for coffee. And we, the mantra of this group is the older we get, the faster we ran. And we all get together and, and I've got such good mates really all around the world. I had one in Aberdeen who I used to go and see until he died. We were very close friends with Bruce Tullow and his wife. And Catherine and I had the tradition of watching the Olympics on their television. And we're still going to do that by going, by having Paris in Wiltshire with Sue Tullow this year. And I was never competitive, I believe, in my work or my life. I'm not a competitive driver, for instance. I'll always want the other person to pass me. And in my career, I didn't keep applying for things. I kept being asked to do things. Uh, but, but once I got to New Zealand, I never really applied for a job. I was always asked to apply or offered something and eventually became dean and then assistant pro vice chancellor of the university, but that was never from seeking that for ambition. I think I burned out all my competitive instincts in racing. <laughs> and the, and oh, the, you're, and the, you're, there's not much left over outside. You're terribly humble. And that's a kind of fortitude and I think character that people love to see in competitors and it not an extreme or a defect, but a, a healthy version of it. And we're probably going to have to do several episodes, I think, to discuss a lot of the things that your career has involved at being an author, being an announcer, but I'd like to get a 
overview here of your return. Let's say like your first return to running after you were out for a while and then back and rediscovering that you could run a little bit and then ramp up the training and you went on to great success in masters racing. Can you talk about that yeah. period so as an example? I'm, I'm happy to, Matthew, because it's something that I'm working on and thinking my way through and writing a bit about. I, I'm one of a group of old competitive runners. The basic qualifications for joining this email group, which is basically American, but has members all around the English speaking world. The basic qualifications is that you need to be over 80 and a serious runner. Wow. You can imagine you've got some really interesting people. And I'm currently in one of these phases of getting back from, uh, uh, the, it's, there's been a whole series of, I've had two knee replacements, then I had lung surgery, and then the latest one was ruptured Achilles tendon. So I'm quite an expert on get, on getting back after your career has ended. <laughs> yeah, and some, of, and, and some of these things you thought your career had ended, right? Oh, absolutely. No question. When I went in for the first knee replacement, this was 13 years ago now, the, the me medical consensus then was that there was no way you were going to run on a, knee, on a knee replacement. As I've often said about it, I, I didn't disobey that, but I just sort of forgot <laughs> the, the way I did because I'd be out for a walk and I'd think, let's jog a little bit. And, and why should jogging for, for 10 seconds do me any more harm than walking for three hours? And that, that kind of, and then I'd get back. And uh, the key thing about it, I think, is that when you have these periods off, you then, of course, that's bad and it's frustrating and it's disappointing, and you'll probably never get back to where you were before. You know that. But once you start building up again, then you get that sense of improvement. And for me, I don't know if this is true of everybody, but for me, that's one of the huge appeals of running is that if you do the work, you will improve. It's really as simple as that. Never mind shoes or diet or anything else. The only thing that will make you get better as a runner is by running. And you do a bit more of it and a bit more of it. And so that process of improvement is hugely satisfying. Now, I'm high this week because... I have just getting back after this ruptured Achilles tendon, which is still, it's still ruptured. I just, I don't have an Achilles tendon on that side, effectively. Having started by just shuffling for kind of five seconds, two days ago, I ran continuously for one hour. Now that was a huge milestone for me. Those two things don't come together. There's been three to four of, in some ways, the hardest months I've ever had because the running is so difficult and certainly was so difficult in the early stages that I'm having to do all these exercises. And the way I do it, and people have, have really taken to this as an idea, I start by running 10 paces on the first day. Go for a walk. You're walking for an hour or two. And then in the middle of it, you do 10 paces. And then two or three days later, you do another 10 paces. And then over about a week, then you do one minute. And from then onwards, then I time it, which stops me from going too fast. You do another minute and then another minute, and then you might join them up and you add a minute or two minutes every three or four days. And it's astonishing. In three months, you go from zero to an hour, which is where I now am. Now I went 48 and 52, 59, and then finally, and I, was, and I was doing them in kind of chunks of 10 minutes and walking in between, and then 15 minutes and walking in between and so on. And it has gradually drawn, even at this age, even though I'm going so pathetically slowly, what you, well, you do when you're 84. <laughs> you, you wait. You wait. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure there's a lot of us sitting in our 60s and 70s that would be but, behind you, yeah. But it's still, that sense of improvement is hugely satisfying. And something else I'm realizing, when you're 84, there's not many things in life that you're improving at. And so in a funny way, that's a bonus of having the injury and the setback. You start again, and then you get that sense of build up and making progress. And this week's run is better than last week's run. And that's great. And yeah. I know I'm realistic. I know I'll never get back to the level I was in the middle of 2023. 
But this has been the story over the last several years. So that process of building back up is hugely satisfying. Okay, I don't know if you can answer this, but what percentage of the population do you think has this either experience or character or where did you get it that you will persist? Even though your shuffling is five seconds, 10 paces, you're going to just, that's, that's a fortitude or mental attitude that I don't think is common. Probably not because it's, it, it's arguably insanity. There we go. I didn't want to say it, it depending on where it ends up, <laughs> so how things work out, that might be sometimes a better description, but yeah. it's just, you know, it's just the way you approach. Yeah. It's senile delusion. It's, I don't know, it's, it's become such a habit now. Yeah. And I, I don't define myself only as a runner, far from it. But being a runner is an important part of how I define myself. And I'm still not quite ready to stop. When that friend said to me when I was 26, you're getting a bit of an oldie for a runner. And I thought, you know, I'm not sure I agree with you. And I still don't. I'll still do it. But we all know, I mean, all runners know, and you can't quite prove it, but we know we're better for doing it. We know we're sharper mentally. We know we feel better. We've got this whole area of kind of purpose and interest and satisfaction that other people don't have. And so I don't see any reason to stop until I absolutely have to, which no doubt is not very far away, but, but uh. well, that's, that's just great. That's a great story. And it's great to hear you tell your attitude about that. Let's just visit two other things you've done, writing about running and your announcing. Fascinating. I've talked to Cree Kelly. He has a great story of starting a shoe shop, being out in Colorado when everything was happening there in the 70s and then becoming an announcer for decades. What's your story of becoming a race announcer? It happened almost by accident, but I have to tell you my favorite Cree story first. <laughs> he's terrific, but he's really, yeah, absolutely. really good. And, and he has one great skill that I don't have, was that he could just keep talking. And, and we were working together once on, on television. I think Catherine was there as well. Some race, I forget, West Virginia or somewhere. And doing the TV commentary on this marathon. And it was rainy or misty or something, and the helicopter couldn't get up. And so there were no pictures. And so Creed talked for two and a half hours <laughs> with, without any pictures. And I was gobsmacked with admiration for this, <laughs> this man. He has an astonishingly active mind and, and his eloquence is constant. Very skilled job. I was very grateful to him that day. Now, I got into it because I was in Christchurch, New Zealand in 1970s, early 70s. And Christchurch got the 1974 Commonwealth Games. Right. which in countries like New Zealand is a very important event because that's one where we can win medals, largely because America was foolish enough to leave the British Commonwealth. So, <laughs> and, and, we, and Britain never got Ethiopia, so we're great. So New Zealand can win some medals. <laughs> and that was going to be very big in Christchurch. I went through a bad time, as I told you, with running and got ill health and I got a, a kind of, what's, well, that kind of bad persistent flu that people can get in their 20s. And I was weak. And so at one track meet, the announcer had to leave early and he asked me if I would take over. This is just a regular kind of weekly track meet. And I took over and did the announcing for him that day. And then from that, they asked me if I would apply for a position of one of the track announcers for the Commonwealth Games. And I was appointed to that. So for, in 74. And of course, I was a beginner, but I did a lot of preparation for it. It happened. I was, I had a, academic leave in England for a while in 1973 and took myself to the British Championships at Crystal Palace. And this one, this is one of my favorite stories. So I went to the announcer's box and Peter Matthews was there and Stan Greenberg. Peter, Peter Matthews is one of the absolute great announcers. And I introduced myself and said, I've got the job at the Commonwealth Games. Can I just sit behind you and watch? And they said, sure. So I did that for two days. One bonus of that was I got to see Dave Bedford break the world record for 10,000 meters. Right. That day. <laughs> but the other thing that I learned, and of course the crowd is focused and Peter was giving splits and saying how close he was to the world record, ahead of my board record share and doing this fab fabulous job, focused on this. That was all wonderful. 
And then at the end of the meet, we were just packing everybody, folding up their papers, and we'd had, had a, they'd had a successful day. And the door opened, was, the, the door was flung open, and there stood, I'd better not name him, but Britain's top shot putter of that time, who was, of course, big by definition, and was quivering with rage. <laughs> and, he, and he said, and you better get your blink to go in on this, he said, every time I put out an, oh, I wanted to do an effing shot, you put out an effing announcement. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> he did, As... and, and he then flung the door shut so hard that it was the, the announcer's box was about halfway up the stand at Crystal Palace. And I thought the whole box was going to slide down the step to the box. <laughs> and I sat there thinking, this job is a lot harder than it looks. And what I learned very quickly is that being a track and field announcer, you're actually in charge of a six ring circus. And you can't ever say anything without looking to see what else is going on. Right. Uh, because you can't talk about the start of the 100 meters as somebody is about to do their, their life-shaping high jump. And you've got to get, it's not just about getting the names right. You've got to be that attentive. That's it for part one. We'll be back in part two. More stories all around the world. More history with Roger Robinson. I hope you enjoyed another episode of Running in the 70s. Voices, stories, and memories of athletes who were running in the 70s. Until next time, wherever you are, keep looking forward and don't forget to look back.